New York types. Finally making the video that I said I'd be making since basically the beginning, if not the beginning. So this will be the intro to a larger series where I'm going to break down each individual archetype. I'll give certain examples. If you can't tell from my spread, I'll be using chess as the example. There's really not any quantifiable standard for what the archetypes are. They were originally proposed by Carl Jung. He was one of the fathers of modern psychological analytics, but he never truly defined what exactly they were. And then after him, I mean, you have a lot more people, but uh, Joseph Campbell is one of the outliers, and he really highlighted the hero's journey. A lot of our most famous movies like Star Wars, Hunger Games, those all follow Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And you'll kind of see throughout the series a lot of those elements. We as a species must define things to understand them. The gods, spirits, and Jotnar may exist in one or multiple dimensions, but we experience them through our minds. This is why Odin can be an old man with a vagabond appearance, or a well-dressed king clad in ravens and wolves with an eagle helm. Humanity must put concepts into buckets, boxes, and categories. Without these, our minds cannot grasp them, and we cannot explain them. If you don't know my verbiage, and you're unfamiliar with my language, you won't be able to understand me. As we have evolved, risen from the primordial depths out of the forests and plains, we have carried something with us. Anthropomorphization. We give names to hills, faces to trees, personalities to machines. We understand the world through symbols. Semiotics, the study of this, teaches us that we use visual language in order to understand. When I say love, what comes to mind? A heart? A significant other? Freya, Norse goddess of love, beauty, and war? Maybe Aphrodite, Greek goddess of love? Or Lakshmi, Vedic goddess of love? These three goddesses are the same archetype, understood through different cultures, each with unique hardships and values that shape their ideas of love. You'll notice similarities with Sumerian Inanna, their goddess of love. She has two lionesses. Freya has two cats. If you look at the history of deities, you'll notice trends and evolutions. Each of the Norse gods most likely has a Proto-Indo-European counterpart and origin. When the Romans led their conquest before Christianity, they realized this and looked for their gods amongst the indigenous people. The concept of the primordial blueprint, the archaic typology, has been with us since the beginning. It always baffles me when people cannot understand that the gods are connected, because we as a species are connected. Thor, Indra, and Perun are the same deity reinterpreted through different cultural and circumstantial lenses. Here's a quote from Craig Chalquist, link below. Diermes, a giant hammer-wielding thunder god who controls storms and grasps a rainbow in one hand and lightning-throwing bow in the other. As with Thor and Jormungandr, Diermes chases Meandis Pyre. You see the similarities when you look through religion with a humanist lens you begin to understand that the gods exist within us all. So essentially what an archetype is, it's the idea that we as a species have these primordial concepts in our mind. The arc and archetype is like archaic. These are, these are primordial aspects that have been shaped over time. You can think of them as ancient blueprints. And it doesn't lessen the power of the gods or the impact that they have in our lives just because, at least on the logical side, they are a part of us. The gods are in us all. It's the banner I put on my, my Twitter and I believe it's on my YouTube profile too. In runes it says the gods are in us all. And... That's because each one of these archetypes, each one of these, these gods, these story characters have been with us since the beginning. They have taken different shapes, forms, names. Obviously, in the northern perspective, you know, we, we've chosen 
Thor, Odin, Freya, Frigg, Freyr, Tyr, Heimdall, these deities are part of us. And that's why they keep showing up in our stories. Like I said, it doesn't lessen who they are. In fact, if anything, it strengthens it because it's part of us. They are part of us. They are ingrained in the human psyche. And that's what an archetype is. It's this blueprint for certain aspects and they exist within what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. There's a massive misconception that the new age community kind of takes and runs. Um, and that being that, that Carl Jung believed that we were all like interconnected psychically and that, and that the archetypes have actually um, proven religion, uh, when in reality, um, he says this in his book, Man and His Symbols, it was his detractors, not him, that applied magical thinking to the archetypes. And again, that isn't to say that the archetypes mean that the gods don't exist. That means that they do exist definitely on a psychological level. Really, the only debate to be had is do they exist on a spiritual metaphysical level? And like I talked about in my Quantum Fluffy Bunnies video, the emotional side wants to believe in literal deities. And this is true for myself as well. And I want to believe that Thor is in the sky and fighting Jotnar and influencing our lives, at least to a certain degree. But on the logical side, I understand that Thor is an archetype of strength. He is an archetype of the hero, the knight, if you will. And you'll find that that knight archetype, that hero archetype, is very central to a lot of stories as well. And that's really what Thor embodies, is, is that archetype of strength. And he defeats the, the Jotnar, which are the chaos, the shadow. And you'll find that in Jung's teachings and theories, he believed that um, we also have a personal unconscious and my interpretation of that is that we understand these archetypes, these primordial blueprints, through our own understanding. And that's why some of us might be Hellenists or Kemet, which is the um, Egyptian religion. Kemet is actually the original name for Egypt. I'm not sure if they call themselves Kemetists or anything like that. And then... Others of us prefer the Nordic archetypes, the Nordic gods and heroes, because that's something that appeals to our personal unconscious, which is one of the reasons why it's kind of hard to define why you gravitate towards something necessarily, especially without a lot of introspection. I mean, it took me a while to get here, and I'm making a video now. So, so the two sets of chests that I have in front of me are... Harry Potter and the Lewis chess set. This is actually a recreation of a chess set that was found on the Isle of Man. So you'll notice a very like Norman look to them. This looks like a Norman knight. And then this piece is often the Berserker. But for some reason the set I got has the little warden guys on there, which is slightly disappointing. So there's a few reasons why I chose chess. Um, you have the white and the black. So you have the light side and the shadow. And the light side tends to be the good aspects, the aspects the society upholds. In the northern perspective, this is your Asir and your Vanir. These are, um, these are good aspects. And then the shadow are your subversive archetypes, each piece having its polar opposite. And it should be said that the actual rules of chess don't really apply to this model nor does the history of the evolution of the pieces, uh, which is a fascinating history, but um, for all intents and purposes here, it doesn't really matter. And I'll put links in the description on where you can actually get these chess sets. Um, interestingly enough, the Lewis chess set was also in the Harry Potter movie. But 
but the curator at can't remember which museum I'll throw it up on screen, Irving Finkel, and I'll put his video where he talks about it in there too. Uh, it was actually his set that they used. I'm not a huge fan of Harry Potter. The wife is, which is one of the reasons I got this chess set specifically. Then I thought it was kind of fun. So first we'll start with the knight. So the knight is the hero, like I was talking about with Thor. This is your Luke Skywalker, your Katniss, Thor, like I mentioned. Uh, this is the hero of the story. This is the hero's journey that Joseph Campbell talked about. It's very much the central figure of most stories. I'm taking a little bit of creative license with the word rook, but the rook is the trickster. I know it's a little odd because it's the castle motif, but the word rook, the etymology, um, is a little closer to trickster. This is the closest archetype to walking the line of the shadow. This is your Loki, this is your coyote, raven in also Native American myths. Uh, the trickster can very much be a teacher of hard lessons. If I remember correctly, a uh, coyote in a lot of Native American myths, and it does vary from tribe to tribe, has even been depicted as a Prometheus figure, um, which I believe some people even equate Loki to. And then you have your bishop. This is your Cynex, your crone, this is your wise teacher, this is your Gandalf, your Obi-Wan Kenobi, Qui-Gon Jinn to a lesser extent. And you'll notice the avatar I frequently use, it's a doodle of mine, is similar to the bishop. And that's because the Godi is a priest figure, it's a the Cynex, it's a teacher. <laughs> we'll also go over in future videos how, how we live our archetypes. When I was younger, I associated myself more with a knight, and as I get older, I find myself associating more with a cynex. Then you have your queen. I really enjoy how bored this queen looks, by the way. It amuses the crap out of me. She also got a small drinking horn. This one just looks weird. I don't know what's going on here. This is the mother figure, the sacred feminine caretaker. And I know it's a little passe as, as gender norms kind of blur in this modern age. Um, so this isn't necessarily gender connotative. Um, you can very much have a male figure, deity, whatever, that is male archetype that is a nurturer, a caregiver, just like you can have a king that is female. Interestingly enough, there are actually historical accounts of women declaring themselves king, but nevertheless. The king is the leader. Uh, you know, this can be Odin and Tyr if you ascribe to the theory that Tyr was the leader of the uh, Germanic pantheon during the migration period. And then the pawn. Pawn is more of your NPC character, honestly. This is somebody that kind of a background character. Not to say that they aren't important, obviously, but you can think of this as the average person that you see on the street that you don't know their name, they're just another face in a crowd. Um, to you, this is them. And of course in chess they're actually more important than people think. But every piece has a shadow, a subversive archetype. And these are the villains in our stories. And throughout this series, I'll also talk about the people that are more attracted to this subversive archetype and the reasons why. I'll only go over these things briefly here. We're going to expand on them in the future. How each archetype um, reflects who you are, and that's one of the reasons you pick a patron deity. You know, again, some people are attracted to subversive archetypes, what that means. And you'll also find that one archetype doesn't necessarily fit one god, one hero, one character. Odin, for example, fits the king archetype as well as the Synax. Odin also has some trickster qualities, and he has been known to, to walk that subversive line. Likewise, you have deities like Skaldi, who are very much a sacred feminine who comes from the Jotnar, that, that shadow archetype, but she has come on to the um, lighter side, and that's more of a reflection of shadow rather than shadow itself. I'm definitely not somebody that believes that the Jotnar are evil uh, by default. The Asir and the Vanir often marry 
into you know not our lines so it's kind of a an interesting point there I'm also not somebody that necessarily shuns Loki I think Loki is more of a it's more of an example of what happens when you aren't careful with the shadow as this series progresses we're not only going to tackle the Nordic gods but we're also going to tackle uh, various different pop culture archetypes and how they come through and really why they are part of human psychology these characters these deities these archetypes these primordial blueprints keep coming up in our stories they keep resurfacing and then we as individuals associate ourselves with these certain archetypes and in order to be true to yourself you have to figure out what that archetype is and and really expand on that and whenever i go over that I'll, I'll kind of break down persona and and all that other stuff and uh i'm doing it in multiple videos because otherwise it's just be way too freaking long and i don't want to make anybody sit for, through that <laughs> break it up into pieces you know so please if you have any questions uh feel free to comment down below you know, like, subscribe, um, tell me if you disagree, tell me if you want to expand on anything, um, tell me your personal theories, whether it pertains to me using chess or you have your own idea of a model for the archetypes or deity. Just remember, the gods are in us all. Skull!